Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Women in Leadership Talk podcast. I am joined today by Gina Rippon. Gina is out of the UK, and she's joined us. It's minus two there, <laughs> so a little bit cold. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna have a great conversation today, talking about gender and the brain. Um, this is a really interesting topic. I think our audience is going to find riveting. <laughs> so I'm excited that Gina's here with us. So Gina, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for asking me. Yeah, lovely to have you. And I want to thank our audience. We really appreciate you chiming in to the Women in Leadership Talk podcast. You know, our objective is to bring you really interesting and informative uh, topics and interesting individuals that have you know, are having an impact in the world in some way. And hopefully this conversation will have an impact on you. So let me tell you a little bit about Gina so you know who we're actually talking to today. So Gina Rippon is a Emeritus Professor of Cognitive Neuroimaging at the Aston Brain Center at Aston University. She is a past president of the British Association for Cognitive Neuroscience her research involves state-of-the-art brain imaging techniques to investigate developmental disorders such as autism. She's also researching issues associated with unrecognized females on the autistic spectrum. Her research involves the use of neuroscience techniques to explore social processes, particularly those associated with sex and gender issues. She is a passionate supporter of initiatives to address the underrepresentation of women in all spheres of influence, especially in the sciences, and advocates an understanding of the neuroscience of belonging as a framework to address such gender gaps. This is why she caught my attention. <laughs> so I've been reading uh, Gender and Our Brain, which is one of Gina's books, and this really you know, captured my attention because it's a lot about what are the differences in female and male brains. And so I invited Gina to join us today just to talk about some of her research and um, some of the myths and some of the opportunities for us when it comes to uh, gender and especially for women. So Gina, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for having me. Well, it's lovely to see you. So Let's jump in. And, and just for our audience purposes, we do have a little bit of a delay. Um, so she's not hesitating. It's just we have a little pause um, because of our connection. So bear with us. We have lots of really great information to share with you. So Gina, what actually prompted your interest in neuroscience and especially when it comes to gender and brain issues? Well, I've I've had a career long, uh, actually probably lifelong fascination with the brain. Um, and that prompted uh, the undergraduate and postgraduate training that I did. Mm -hmm. And I was very interested in the connection between brain and behavior, but also in the connection between brain and behavior as at the time that I was starting out my career, the idea that men and women had different brains mm -hmm. and that gave them different sets of skills and that gave them different roles in society. So I was really interested in exploring particularly the relationship between how the brain worked and, and what patterns of behavior we might see in males and females. And, and so what have been, um, what have been some of the, I, I guess, most important things that you have found in your research as it relates to the differences in male and female brains? <laughs> Well, rather bizarrely, the most interesting things were finding no differences. Mm. Um, certainly at the beginning of my career, I was setting up a lab and I was investigating the best sorts of tasks for differentiating males and females. And time and again, I just couldn't find any clear cut differences. And I assumed um, quite rightly, probably that, you know, that I was doing something wrong. But I then went back and had a good look at the research literature and said, you know, let's have a real look at how powerful these differences are and, and um, you know, what's the best way of investigating them. And it was at that point I realized that there was a deeply flawed uh, sort of research, if you like, 
uh, based on the idea that men and women definitely had different brains. And we arrived at that idea before anybody could really look at brains properly. Mm. And the idea that uh, men and women behaved differently. They certainly had different positions in society and that somehow this was linked to their biology. So as a, a sort of biological researcher, I, I was starting, that was my starting point. And then I thought, this isn't as clear cut as the story we've been told. <laughs> and, and so, Gina, why do you think we've been told that story, <laughs> that there is a difference between male and female brains? Well, I think it, it started end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, when studying the brain was emerging or understanding the brain was emerging to be the way in which we could understand human behavior in all aspects of, 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 of hu understanding humans. But the starting point was that ma males and females were definitely different. Uh, in fact, the starting point was that females were inferior to males. Mm -hmm. And the um, unsurprisingly male scientists at the time decided that in order to credibility to their science, they should find ways of proving this inferiority. So a lot of the early research was trying to find out what it was that made women's brains inferior. There was no challenge to the idea, that idea itself. So obviously, hopefully we've moved on somewhat from that, but it was that kind of hunt the difference agenda that had informed really the history of neuroscience right up to the advent of, of brain imaging at the end of the last century in the 1990s. Men and women had different brains. Let's find ways of, of measuring that difference, characterizing that difference. Um, so I think we're looking at, at the, the consequences of a, an unchallenged myth, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and there, you know, I think we have moved a little bit. <laughs> away from that but there's still such a long way to go right so in your in your book uh gender in our brains you talk about this neuro trash can you tell us more about what what does that really mean and so our audience has a has a good uh, understanding of what neuro trash is right well when brain imaging arrived in the 1990s, um, one of the really fascinating uh, ways of depicting the findings was via visual images. So mm -hmm. uh, the kind of brain images that we're all used to are actually just a, a sort of statistical product, if you like. So somebody somewhere worked out how to uh, visualize the signals that we were measuring and came up with compelling images um, with it, which had usually a kind of cross-section, grey and black cross-section of somebody's head with the brain inside, and then uh, nice patches of red or blue or yellow or whatever, um, indicating where the greatest sources of activation were. Mm. And that captured the imagination, obviously, of researchers, because it was a great way of communicating what you were finding. But it also captured the imagination of a lot of sort of what I call self-help gurus. So mm -hmm. people who were writing a lot about men and women being different. Very often they were relationship advisors or careers advisors, etc. And their story was was compellingly illustrated by reference to these images, very often without any clear explanation of what they were actually measuring. But it just looked great. You know, you could say I found the, you know, the, the God spot in the brain or the chocolate preference spot in the brain etc and there was a whole tranche of, of of findings where people put neuro in front of everything so you could mm -hmm. have neuro aesthetics or neuro but you could also have things like neuro architecture so there was a big move to say there's a particular way in which you can make people happy or you can particular kind of marketing for example so you just had to illustrate that when you were showing somebody the right, in inverted commas, advert, bits of their brain would light up. Uh, and I call that genre, and it's not just me, it, you know, the Mars and Venus genre, you know, very mm -hmm. famous book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And that was a, about relationships in particular, but it, it sort of captured the imagination of marketing uh, and just said, well, men and women are different. We need to target them differently, or careers advisors or educators everybody had this sort of fixed belief, which was unhelpfully <laughs> illustrated by these 
shapes images. Um, and if you started looking at what was being quoted, you realize that the people writing hadn't read the, gone right back and read the original research properly. Mm. And what they were claiming wasn't what was being found, etc. So there was a lot of books like that, you know, why, why men can't cry and women can't read maps, those kind of books, for example. Um, <laughs> and so it's really a, a nice argument um, based, unfortunately, on a flawed premise. Interesting. Wow. That's uh, that is really fascinating. And, and and fortunately, what happens is that paints a picture. So the example you just gave about women not being able to read a map that paints the picture that, you know, we're not analytical, we're not able to um, problem solve, find our way out of a paper bag. <laughs> so it does create that image of we are inferior, um, you know, and, and, and that's such a, that's so interesting that these myths, as you say, have carried on for so long. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, there was a, a sort of slight shift, which again was a clever bit of marketing. So instead of inferiority, uh, people started talking about complementarity. Oh. So the idea was that women had the kind of skills that complemented the skills that men had. So men were, you know, independent and, and rational and great explorers, whereas women were nurturant and homemakers, etc. So the idea was that you didn't necessarily diss the... Um, the, the skills that women had, but you said, oh, they're very useful as a, as a backup for our great heroes and, and scientists, et cetera. Oh my goodness, that's fascinating. And when you think about that, you can see how that would shift perspective as to how we view women and why we think women um, sometimes aren't capable to be leaders of, you know, whether it be politically or, uh, from the sciences or corporate, when we absolutely have all the capabilities uh, of, you know, performing and and holding these roles, and sometimes even better, because we we will, you know, tend to challenge <laughs> some of those myths as you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I think one thing I should probably say also is the idea that the term difference probably means something different to scientists than it does mm. to the kind of public consciousness. So we assume different means quite distinct. So, you know, all women are like this and all men are like that, for example. Uh -huh. uh, but when you actually look at the research, which is obviously, you know, where, where I came in, you know, you realize that there's a huge amount of overlap between the data um, that you get from women and the data you get from men. And that actually at its population level, there's the differences between males and females are absolutely tiny, um, vanishingly small. Uh, and so when we talk about, you know, women can do this, you know, women are empathic and men are um, systemizers, for example, we, we have this impression that all women are empathic and, and, and they're not. not. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's that's really unfortunate. <laughs> That's that's a that's a really great um, call out because we're not right. We're not all created equal, and we have very different realities um, as to how we um, how we show up in the world. So, you know, a lot of the neuroscience breakthroughs and in, in binary distinctiveness are being challenged. So, what have you uh, what have you been able to discover through your research, and how has that progressed or developed over the past thirty years? Okay. Well, I think that probably also should say at some point that we need to think about whether we're talking about sex in the biological sense of the word, or whether we're talking about gender in the kind of social sense of the word. Because very often, again, you know, a bit like the term different, they're not always clearly defined. Mm -hmm. And certainly nowadays, when people talk about gender, they may mm -hmm. well be talking about sex. So we talk about gender pay gaps, for example, and gender reveal parties, heaven for fend. Um, whereas actually, <laughs> there is a really sex pay gaps and sex reveal parties, which might, of course, make you think of something else. But um, I think the idea is that, that we need to be careful how the terms are used, because particularly with respect to neuroscience, we, we know that that is quite a significant distinction. Because if we talk about gender and the kind of experiences, different experiences that people have based mm -hmm. on whether they're male or female, 
they can change the brain quite drastically. And therefore, what look like differences because somebody is a man and somebody else is a female uh, is a woman may well be because those two groups of people have had very different experiences growing up and right. that has shaped their brain. Um, and that, I think that's that's an important. Uh, and I guess, I mean, you talked about binary distinctiveness and I think mm -hmm. that's really important uh, because really the campaign that I've been on is to try and break this link between mm -hmm. this, you know, link of inevitability between your biological sex and your gender identity. Um, and, you know, I think that's what research has been showing. Um, yes, there are biological influences in terms of individual differences, mm -hmm. but they are also shaped quite dramatically by, by the environment. Um, yeah. So that's important to remember. And the whole idea is also that, of course, gender as a binary concept was historically linked to the fact that sex was binary. So it was assumed that you can only be male or female or masculine or, or feminine. And as we know, <laughs> that's certainly an issue of debate today. Most definitely, most definitely. So what, <clears throat> if, we, if we think about um, what some of the biggest problems are to solve currently as it pertains to gender, like, how do we how do we navigate that, Gina? <laughs> because it is it is a it is a very complex. Um, I think people trying to understand even you know how do we even step into understanding it, uh, and maybe share an example of some of those gender paradoxes that that you're seeing. Yes, I mean I I think it is it's hugely important. Um, and first of all, we need to start very, very early. I mean, I think that's that's an issue uh, that we had never realized until very recently how highly socially tuned even newborn babies are. Yeah. So we look at the world, we look at children growing up and we say, oh, look, you know, look how different boys and girls are. That must be because, as, you know, their biological differences. We don't realize that the gendered world that we live in, and I, I would make that as a, a statement of fact, um, is actually producing those differences. Yeah. And we need to be aware of that. And so I think that's that's something that we could tackle. Um, to me, the only way forward, and it it's, sounds paradoxical, is for gender to be irrelevant. So actually, it doesn't matter whether somebody's male or female, what, you know, the context if you you try to employ somebody to do a particular task what are the skills needed for that task mm -hmm. and who has those skills but certainly get away from saying that oh you know um we want somebody who's logical or rational etc so let's go for a male or we want somebody who's going to be empathic and a team builder um or a people pleaser or something let's go for a female so i think those those are the aspects that it would be good to pursue well, that's a that's a great point, and you're right. Like I, when I was reading your book, like I was fascinated when you were talking about as a baby how we we start to shape. <laughs> so the environment, when you were saying that earlier, the environment plays such a big role in shaping how we um, how we grow as human beings. And you know, I think that's really interesting. And and you know, it's even if we think back to women or girls, as an example, you know, we're often told, be good, don't, don't speak up, you know, you're going to come across as being too, um, you know, too bossy, <laughs> too aggressive, where boys are encouraged to be aggressive. And, and part of that is teaching each, no matter what gender it is, like teaching them how to have a voice, how to speak up, how to, you know, be able to express what it is they need to to be able to get across to others that that's absolutely right i mean um reshma sojani who uh, founded girls who code which was mm -hmm. a way of encouraging is setting up after school clubs in fact to try and get girls more interested in computer science she has this great phrase we raise our boys to be brave and our girls to be perfect mm -hmm. and i think that kind of sums up <laughs> Uh, a lot of the downstream consequences of exactly that approach. And uh, I think if we made people realize that that's what's happening, 
um, that would be very helpful. Um, and I think the other aspect is to be aware of how much the environment can affect people's behaviors, people's decisions, people's choices. And, and this comes back to the idea of science, for example, mm. that, you know, the suggestion that a contemporary suggestion that in the most gender equal countries, in inverted commas, um, there's the greatest underrepresentation of women in science. And that's mm. sort of been jumped on as another essentialist explanation so that, you know, even where the playing fields are equal, quote, um, women are choosing not to do science. So there must be mm -hmm. some kind of biological imperative behind that. But then if you start to look at science as a, an institution and the context of science and, um, you know, the, the, the kind of chilly climate that is evident, to coin a phrase, in, in science, you could say, well, actually, there's a lot going on in that environment. Yeah. which is turning certain individuals away from it. Um, and that could be something we should be looking at rather than assuming that the, the fault, if you like to call it a fault, lies in the individual. Yeah, I, I love how you say that. And, and we could take that so many different directions <laughs> um, because the environment does play a huge role in how, you know, how we're engaging in the world. Um, whether it be conscious or unconscious, <laughs> you know, the, that that's a lot of what creates the biases that we have. Um, and, you know, this is the sciences, it's in technology, mathematics. Um, I, I've started doing a lot of work, by, like I work with a lot of clients in the technology industry and, you know, I hear the same thing. So, you know, it, it's hard to find women to be in that industry, but it's not really, <laughs> it's a male perception that it's hard to find women for that industry. And, and so it's how do we encourage that at a young age and expose people to a variety of opportunities, right? And we're all gonna gravitate to different things that we like. Um, and, and so, but if you're not ever exposed to it, then how do you know if you want to be in the sciences or the mathematics or technology or, you know, whatever it may be? Yeah. And, and if there's a belief which will be evident to you from a very early age that people like you, in inverted commas, don't do science, mm -hmm. then that will have, you know, have consequences very early on, which will have kind of cascading effects as you grow up. Um, and that's what we want to avoid. Uh, I, I think that's that's a key issue. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with you. And I, I only say, you know, because I've just had my youngest go through. She just graduated high school. And one of the you know, one of the things that she's come out saying is, oh, I'm not good at the math and I'm not good at the science. And I'm like, uh, actually, you're very good at it. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's. It, it's her perception because there might be a boy who was like top of the class. And so she's even comparing herself. And so, you know, we have to encourage more of the, you know, yes, you are good at these things and try different things and just see what resonates with you. Mm, yes. I think that ties in with kind of girls, perfect, the problem of perfectionism, you know, because if they, they say, I go and give talks in schools and they say, oh, I don't like science, it's hard. Yeah. And you, when, when you say, what do you mean by hard? And they actually mean that you can get it wrong. And, mm -hmm. you know, if their identity is embedded in the idea that they're a good girl and they, they get top marks, they don't want to expose themselves to something which they actually need to get wrong. Uh, they don't like the idea. So I, I think the perception of science is, is, is important as well as individuals perception of their skills. Yes, 100%. And I love how you just framed that, Gina, because, you know, for our audiences, you know, I, I want you to think about how many of us, you know, are focused on this perfection syndrome. And, and this is male and female. And, you know, when we don't get it right, we beat ourselves up, we do this internal dialogue of, you know, we failed, and that's okay, like, because that's how you learn, right? Science fails all the time, but then you try something different. And, figure out what does work and that will evolve as time goes on. But that environment plays such an important role because, you know, I'm the type mother who has always encouraged my children to try things. And yet, 
they still come out and say, I'm not very good at that. And, and so it is helping them, you know, hey, it's not about being perfect at it, right? So as an example, my daughter was making B's, but everything else she made A's in. So to your point, she was beating herself up because she wasn't making A's in chemistry or in functions and, and vectors, <laughs> right? So, so that does play a, a really important role in the perception of how we see ourselves. I think that's absolutely right. And I, I think that's very much a function, not just of the individual. It doesn't come from the person themselves. It, it comes from the their, you know, their environment, they're from social media, from adverts, from everybody. You know, people, you know, parents talk about bringing up their children gender neutral. And I think, oh, you know, what kind of box did keep them in? Do they never go to nursery? Do they never watch television? Do they never play video games? Do they never get presents from well-meaning relatives, etc.? Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think the gender bombardment in the 21st century in particular is 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 um has a huge impact on on everybody yeah yeah i would agree with that um and we could talk forever on that topic <laughs> but i do want to because i i am cognizant of your time and and i want to make sure we get to cover everything so you know i of course buying your book i'm curious and fascinated with neuroscience and how the brain works and just you know more about that um what happens with brain plasticity? Like we're, we're told, oh, your brain is formed by the time you're X years old. And we know now that that's not really true. Like you can, you can shift how you're operating. So maybe talk a little bit about that and even how routine skills have an impact on that brain plasticity. Mm. I think the sort of advent of the understanding of brain plasticity is probably the, one of the biggest shifts in, in neuroscience in the last 30 or 40 years because mm. it was assumed you know that you were born with your adult number of brain cells and that was what was going to carry you through life uh, until the end of it and nothing changed and so there was a, a kind of fixed inevitability about the brain that you had and therefore what you could do with it and it wasn't until really the sort of again with the advent of, of, of neuroimaging or freely available neuroimaging that we realized that the brain changed a lot depending mm. on what you did um, every day or over time and that this was a, a very important demonstration of the idea that we needed to get away from this kind of fixed essentialist mm -hmm. view of the link between brain and behavior so in in the UK there's some really nice studies done with taxi drivers um, black cab drivers in London have to do an amazingly complex task called the knowledge which is actually learning I think it's something like 10,000 routes within six miles of Charing Cross wow. um, in detail uh, and it takes about three or four years to actually acquire that knowledge before you can become a taxi driver and lots of, lots of people fail um, what it has served as a very useful experiment because people have set up so that you could look at people before they trained as a taxi driver while they were training, while they were operating as taxi drivers. And also interesting what, what happened when they retired. And you can see the way in which the brain changes as they acquire mm -hmm. the knowledge and retain that knowledge while they're being taxi drivers. But once they retire and they're not using that anymore, then the brain changes disappear. So it goes to show that the experiences that you're exposed to, which could, of course, be gendered, for example, will change the brain. And so a brain that looks different, for example, visuospatial skills are supposedly a very robust difference between males and females. But if you actually look at the training opportunities that males and females have had, either gendered so boys tend to play with construction toys and get given construction toys and play games with a kind of spatial element etc so if you take those kind of training opportunities into account then the sex differences disappear uh, and I think that's that's a really important message um, and I, I think understanding that our brains can change is is very important um, mm. because otherwise people will just say well you know my my brain doesn't work that way <laughs> and you can easily say well it could it, um, exactly it has consequences <laughs> Absolutely. And that's why I brought it up because 
in the work that I do, I hear this often from executives where they'll say, well, I am who I am. You know, I'm too old to learn or I'm too old to change. And it's like, well, you actually can. And if you want to, right, if you choose to. And but there is this again, it goes back to that ingrained um, conversations that we've had from early, early centuries on that, you know, by the age of X, you're you formed your brain cells and you're not going to change that. So thank you for clarifying that. And so that brings me to the the question just to wrap us up, like when we think about some of those deep learning systems, like what is that impact, uh, especially now that we have AI coming in? Um, what data is being input to AI and how will that impact mm. both gender and, and the brain? Yeah, I, I think that's a major concern that we need to be wary of. Um, one of the things, one of the data sets that the um, World Economic Forum has come up with is looked at emerging technologies like cloud computing and robotics, etc., and demonstrated the appalling lack of females in those areas. Even in some cases, um, the rep percentage representation of, of females is going backwards. So okay. these are the individual, this, you know, the group of people doing this are determining, not to put too strong a point in it, a lot of our future. Yeah. And if they're not fully representative of the world, then that's very, very concerning. Um, and there's some so sort of surface concerns about, you know, AI is something that they're asked to come up with a list of names of potential CEOs of a business, they always come up with white male names, et cetera, because they've looked at, you know, the data on the internet and all the CEOs they see, or nearly all of them are white males. So they assume that's what you want. So that's a kind of surface indication, but I think it's much more serious than understanding all sorts of things not just based solely on gender, but things like lived experience. You know, how do people live their lives? What do their days look like? Um, and how might we um, support that or even mm -hmm. prevent that, if you like, um, mm -hmm. with, with AI solutions? Um, and if those lived experiences aren't being examined fully, um, then the solutions that are arrived at are only going to support Quite possibly a very small proportion um, of, of the people whose lives are being governed by AI. Yeah, that's my that's my concern, and I, I that's why I wanted us to talk about that because if what you're putting in <laughs> is not representative of the masses, it continues to perpetuate this idea of what we started with in the 18th century, that women are inferior, men are superior. We're just compounding those issues and not looking at what's actually the day in, day out of people's lives. And the way I see that is we're doing more harm than we are good, even though the intent of AI is to do better. <laughs> so yeah, it is yes, concerning. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, Gina, thank Yes, that's right. And and I, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Please finish what you were going to say. <laughs> no, no. I, I was, I was just going to, to, to confirm um, what you said and to say that it's, it's, it's a continuing argument. If you like, it goes right back to the 18th, 19th century. It's just couched in different terms. Um, and it's based on a, a stereotypical perception um, about differences Mm -hmm. which science doesn't support uh, and as a scientist or any scientist we should draw attention to that and say this is actually not how things are and if you're designing your our future <laughs> based on this stereotype then we need to stop and think and be very careful yeah yeah slow it down because <laughs> we're moving so fast that I think a lot of those nuances are being missed uh, which is which is concerning very concerning Well, Gina, thank you so much for you know joining us today. Um, this has been a great conversation. I, you know, to our audience, um, I would you know encourage you to pick up some of Gina's books. Um, you know, the one I showed you earlier. If you're looking at this from a visual perspective, it's Gender in Our Brains. If you're listening from an audio perspective, 
Um, again, that's Gina Rippon. I think that, you know, you've highlighted a number of things from your research that sometimes it's easy for us to bury our heads in the sand. <laughs> And we're at a place in our world where we can no longer bury our heads. We have to be paying attention to what creates some of these systemic biases and barriers that are taking place in our world. And um, you've given some really great examples today. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure. And just let me say thank you to our audience for being here today. Uh, if you're curious about your leadership and how you're showing up in the world, please go on to Will Empowered's website. That's 1L, willempowered.com, and take our free leadership quiz. That'll give you some insight as to how you're showing up as a leader. And again, we know you have a choice as to what podcast you listen to. So we thank you very much for continuing to chime in to Women in Leadership Talk. Thank you, everyone, and have a beautiful day.